This is a talk about hope, and I think hope is important. And in, in this talk, I'm going to deal with it in two senses. In the first sense, hope is important for everyone in this period after COVID. And I always think in the morning, after, you know, for many years after I heard a quote from Nelson Mandela, when I get up, I think Mandela said, it's not how many times that I get knocked down, it's how many times I get back up again. That is what you should use to judge me. And that's not just important for everyday life. I think that's also important in engineering. And I'm pro vice chancellor for engineering and physical sciences here at Queen's. And that means as part of my job, I, I want to inspire the thousands of students that come here with both the resilience that, that Mandela's quote illustrates, but also something about creativity. And creativity is something that I don't think people meet very often in engineering. They're kind of familiar with people in white coats or whatever, you know, people in, in you know, looking at engines in cars during, during tests or, or, or services. But engineering is really about creativity. And there's a really good example of that. Um, a lady called Lillian Bland, who conducted the first powered flight in, in Ireland. Back in 1903, the Wright brothers had successfully flown um, in North Carolina. And Lillian read about their exploits and began to build gliders and models uh, over a period of time between uh, 1908 and 1911. And she eventually reached the point where she'd made enough progress to put an engine into her, into her airframe. And unfortunately, there was no manufacturer of aviation engines in Ireland. And so she ordered one from, from, um, from the mainland. And she went across to collect the engine after lots and lots of delays. And when she went to the factory, I think one thing you have to remember is that these engines were really experimental at the time and to generate enough power to fly, the propeller was bigger than me. And uh, the first time they demonstrated the engine to Lillian, uh, the power created by it was so great that the, that the propeller disintegrated and almost uh, injured and killed all the people that were witness to it. But she didn't let that daunt her and she took the engine back and fitted it to the aircraft. And even in tests, the first time that she tried the engine, uh, it destroyed part of the airframe. And so she had to rebuild the aircraft twice before, it were, before the aircraft itself was strong enough even to begin to think about a test flight. Another thing to remember is that Lillian was testing her ideas in Northern Ireland. She wasn't testing it in the beach, on a beach in, in, in uh, the United States. Um, and it took her, uh, it was 12 miles to cycle from her home to the field where she could begin to fly the aircraft. And it took her five weeks before the rain stopped enough for her to conduct the first test flights. That again illustrates something about perseverance in engineering. Anyway, when she uh, got to the test field and she was about to fly the aircraft, she realized that she couldn't put enough fuel into the fuel tank um, because of the way the engine was fitting into the airframe. Um, and so showing true ingenuity of an engineer, she ended up fitting a whiskey bottle to the engine, but then she couldn't fill the whiskey bottle. And so in order to get the fuel into the whiskey bottle attached to the engine, she had to steal her aunt's hearing aid. And that's like a, a cone thing that they used in those days. And so you can imagine that the tremendous amount of, well, courage, ingenuity, creativity, and just basic engineering knowledge to even get to that, to that stage. Lillian's story is instructive because she realized that her, her tests, if you like, were not really going anywhere um, because the engine that she fitted wasn't really powerful enough to sustain the flight uh, that she imagined. So she got several hundred meters, but no further. And to put a stronger or larger engine into the aircraft would have destroyed the airframe. Um, and so her father, who was worried about her being an engineer, uh, persuaded her to give up her test flights by effectively bribing her with a car, which at the time was the, you know, the, the, the object that she wanted to pioneer with um, the most. Now, Lillian's story is interesting because she immigrated to Canada um, and died in the 1970s. And so our lives overlapped by a, by a small amount of time. Um, but I never had the fortune to meet her, but I remember her all the time. And if we look back about, say, five or six years ago, I was working as part of a team to uh, plan for 
long duration human space flight. So for those of you that might have seen the Hollywood film, The Margin, it was that kind of scenario. How can we, put, how can we keep people alive long enough, for example, on the surface of Mars uh, to conduct scientific experiments and to bring them home safely? And one of the things I had to do is pre in preparation for that was to look at the Apollo missions and see how they'd planned for those. And uh, I can remember some of the kind of weird ingenuity that the early NASA astronauts and engineers uh, resorted to in their planning. So for example, uh, the early plans for the Apollo missions considered sending two or three spacecraft to the moon at the same time, with the idea that if one got into trouble, they could transfer across the fleet, if you like. And that was borrowing ideas from the Mayflower and the early American uh, explorers, or the explorers to the Americas. Um, another idea that they had was if something happened to the, to the crew on the surface of the moon, how would they stay alive long enough for a rescue mission if anything could, like that could be planned? And so they, they experimented with edible spacecraft. So a material that was uh, you know, sufficient to keep them alive by eating small parts of the lander. Unfortunately, that's not a very good story because at the end, the astronauts tasted the material and they said that they would rather die than have to live on this, on this, uh, on this material that they were building the spacecraft of. If we come back to the Mars missions, what we were looking at was writing a computer program that would enable the astronauts uh, to use the resources that they had on the spacecraft to keep them alive. So people may have seen the Apollo 13 film, for example, um, where people had to use the, the uh, ground team's advice to uh, reconfigure the spacecraft to get them back um, after an explosion and a, and a problem on the, on, the, on the spacecraft. Now, in the case of the Mars missions, we were trying to write computer programs to do that. And at the heart of it, I think, was fundamental problems in trying to instill creativity, instill ingenuity, instill courage, instill all of the things that Lillian Bland um, exhibited in a computer program. And there's kind of a twist at the end of this, which is that uh, we made a certain amount of progress, but I never thought we ever got close to approximating what, what Lillian exhibited. But at the end of it, engineers started to ask, well, if we can do this for a spacecraft, in other words, write a program that helps us to detect problems and resolve problems in a spacecraft, maybe what we could do is write a computer program that looks for signs of mental illness or stress in the crew. And at that point, I felt that we'd come full circle and that we were back to, for those of you that may have seen the film 2001 by Stanley Kubrick, the computer HAL that takes control of the spacecraft. So I don't know what the, what the barriers for human ingenuity and computer programming are into the future, but I do know that we need to be guided by the hope and optimism of Lillian Bland. I think she shows the correct use of technology to inspire us and to challenge us. And if we pay too much attention to the science fiction or the, or the dark ideas of Hollywood, then I think that we won't progress in the same way that we would if we had the optimism of both Lillian and Mandela. Thank you. <laughs>